Chapter 336 Awakening of the Ancient Powerhouse Thirty years later. In a luxurious house, a young man of twelve or thirteen years slowly opened his eyes. Huh? Where am I? Looking at his little body, Draven was in a daze. Did the reincarnation succeed? Draven muttered in shock. Draven was the former powerhouse of the Nexus continent. The divine forger who could fight and kill with a hammer. I wonder how long it's been. Looking at his memories, there was an unrecognizable expression on his face. A decade of memories seemed too foreign to him. Draven didn't even know if he had reincarnated into the same world. Feeling his battle will's presence around the continent, he confirmed that he was still in the same Ethereum realm. Before he could further process his thoughts, the door opened, revealing a woman who hurriedly approached him. So, are you fine? Does your head still hurt? And no, I'm fine, Draven said, embarrassed. It was the first time someone had shown genuine concern for him, leaving him in a daze. That's good. I can't have little Draven leaving us just like that. After kissing him until she had enough, the woman looked at him seriously. Draven, although you have trash talent, you don't need to worry. Your father, your siblings, and I can still support you without worries for the rest of your life. In the future, we could even buy life extension medicine. So please, son, don't be stupid, okay? After seeing the woman's sincere look, Draven simply nodded. By analyzing the memories in his mind, he learned that the previous Draven was too stubborn and would rather die than live such a trashy life. His talent was trash and even his comprehension was average. In such a prosperous empire, Draven's situation couldn't be said to be unique. However, Draven wasn't committing suicide, he was practicing a stupid method that made Draven smile. In his previous life, Draven was also mediocre. He was a crazy bastard who would cut off his limbs if it made him stronger. Thus, after becoming a blacksmith for a few years, he had the crazy idea of forging his body with various metals. This suicidal method was Draven's only chance. Picking up his hammer and a piece of iron, he mashed it bit by bit into his body. Of course, as a mediocre individual, Draven nearly died. If it weren't for Malgren passing by and taking an interest, he wouldn't even be alive to become the top powerhouse of the Nexus continent. As for the former Draven of this body, he also used a similar method. Using his parents' money, he bought some cheap nanobots and injected them into his body. This should have been safer and more successful than what he did in his previous life. Unfortunately, the nanobots that Draven bought were just cheap imitations. They could only be used for big industrial projects, not in the body. With a scan of his consciousness, he could still feel the little nanobots on the verge of exploding. Fortunately, he had powerful consciousness and easily suppressed them. After calming down his mother, Draven began to think about his future. According to the agreement they had with Malgren, they would meet in the abyss once they were resurrected. However, looking at his feeble body, he couldn't even go to the abyss in this condition. Moonlight Empire It seems that you're my only chance. Setting his goal, Draven spent months studying the history and current situation of the Moonlight Empire. After studying, Draven still couldn't believe that this was the former Nexus continent. Although it's not as prosperous as the Arcane continent, the potential is huge. Draven can't take his mind off the previous barbaric continent, now replaced by the peaceful empire. However, times like this can only create a bunch of weak powerhouses. Draven thought with a sigh. The Nexus continent was barbaric for a reason. Hard times create heroes. They are made to survive and thrive in the toughest times, like a sword forged in the flames and coldness of war. However, looking at his mother, who was spoiling him like a little kid, Draven unconsciously smiled. What happened, darling? Is your body still hurt? No, mom. I want to work. Work? What's wrong? Are we not providing enough food for you? Don't worry, I'll ask your brother to send some allowance back. That brat has been addicted to games, he didn't even come back even if something happened to his brother. No, I want to work because I don't want to be a burden on the family. Furthermore, staying at home and doing nothing is boring. To regain his past strength, some allowance is not enough. He already found all the materials that he needed for his early training. However, looking at the combined prices, Draven just cringed at the price. But you can't work, you're only thirteen, his mother asked in confusion. In the Moonlight Empire, the years from 1 to 14 are considered the years of enlightenment. During these years, individuals are limited in almost every aspect of their lives. 
They aren't allowed to attend school, their practice time is limited to a few hours a day, their screen time is also restricted, and working is prohibited. All these restrictions are intended to ensure that children are carefree and can better integrate into the empire during their childhood. This law, which borders on brainwashing, was, of course, promulgated by Maximus. He aims to nurture his people from childhood so that in the future, even if they reach unimaginable heights, all they could think of were the happy memories from their childhood. Upon hearing this absurd rule, Draven clenched his fists. Who's the bastard who created this rule, preventing him from making money? Oh, I know. What about joining your brothers and sisters in the game? A game? Will that make money? Ha ha ha, of course. Otherwise, why do you think we are rich? Although their wealth mainly comes from various benefits provided by the empire, there is no denying that the game played a significant role in their family's success. What game? Draven asked doubtfully. Their screen time was limited, let alone digital games. All that was available to them were some movies, forums, and a few basic functions. That's right. You just turned 13 a few months ago. Games aren't allowed for children aged 1 to 12, which made Draven curious about their family business. Don't worry, your brother will run you through the details later. A few days later. Draven looked at the pod before him, still clueless about the so. Called games that could make money. You're here, Draven, his brother greeted, patting him on the back. Brother. Hmm, just get into the gaming pod, I'll explain to you inside. Getting into the pod, Draven felt his consciousness sink, taking him into a new world. The ground and the sky were white, looking around, crowds and crowds of people seemed to fill this infinite space. In the distance, Draven saw a gigantic colosseum, a majestic temple, and a tall building filled with lights. Before he could think anything, a panel popped up in front of him, showing his brother's indicator. David wants to teleport to you. Accept slash decline. Tapping on accept, he saw his brother suddenly appear in front of him. How is it, Draven? Isn't it just a virtual world? Draven rolled his eyes. The arcane continent had this product countless epochs ago. Although he didn't try it, a mere virtual world was not his concern. Anyway, how could we earn money in this world? You're so boring. His brother said, seeing his nonchalant reaction. First, let me tell you about this world. This is the Moonlight Plane, the virtual world you mentioned. The three architectures you see from afar are the Battle Colosseum, Moonlight Engine, and Codexia. The Battle Colosseum, as the name suggests, is a place to fight. Really? Draven clenched his fist, wanting to give it a try. Not so fast, it's an adult-only game, you need to be 15 before you can use it. Oh, Draven's eyes dimmed, hearing this nonsense rule again. The Moonlight Engine, on the other hand, is the creator's dream. In it, you could create anything and upload it to the Moonlight Ethernet. Unfortunately, until now, no product has been completed. Does that mean if you could create a popular app, it would make you rich? Duh, of course. With over 100 quadrillion of population, even if 1% of people use your app, it's already a quadrillion. Just imagine the money flowing through your pocket. TSK, TSK, what a dream. Oh. Let me guess, I'm also not allowed to use it? Ha ha ha, how did you know? Are you a genius or something? Draven, straight face. Anyway, even if you are allowed to use it, an individual simply cannot stand a chance within the market. By now, there are already millions of companies racing in this blank area to compete for the market. These companies aren't just made up of hundreds or thousands of people. To even have a chance of survival in this emerging market, a company must have at least billions of people. Oh! Draven nodded, understanding that this route didn't work for him. For a muscle head like him, it's easier to hammer billions of metal than to manage billions of people. As for Codexia, this is where we will earn sacks of money. Chapter 337 System Mastery Codexia is a world personally crafted by the Emperor using the Moonlight Engine. Codexia is an infinite open world made of inscriptions and runes, created to enlighten and teach us about it. Furthermore, playing this game could gradually strengthen your soul, David explained. The Emperor Draven fell into thought. From birth to death, everyone in the Moonlight Empire was marked by this so-called emperor. It can be said that the emperor is their sustenance of faith, the god of the Moonlight Empire. Although somewhat skeptical of some of the emperor's achievements, Draven still had to give credit to this emperor for managing the former Nexus continent like this. So what about this game world? 
How do we make money? There are many ways to make money, but the main way is through currency exchange. The currency you have in this virtual world could be directly cashed in through your bank at a one-to-one -one ratio. So much? So, Codexia's money is equivalent to real-world currency? Draven was a little shocked. Just by rough guess, Draven knew the money needed to run things here was immense. This added another halo to the emperor again, giving the people an imagination of unlimited wealth. Don't think it's easy to earn money in this game. Your brothers and sisters in the game are just a small guild barely getting by. We can only earn thousands of magic crystals per day, grinding day and night. Is it really that hard? Draven shrugged his shoulders undaunted. With countless epics of knowledge, if not for his limited strength and various nonsensical rules, making money would be as easy as picking. He was a divine forger, a wealthy profession that regards money as dirt. Draven didn't think that a mere game could stop him. Teleporting to the ancient temple, Draven quickly registered in the game. Alias, Divine Forge. Level, 0. Class, None. Wealth, 0. Inscription Tab. In the game, Draven looked around curiously. It was a forest with the most common resources, from stones, rocks, trees, grass, and such. It was all mortal tier that one could see everywhere in the world. How do I make money in this? His brother didn't tell him how the game mechanics work. He said that he would know once he was inside. Just when he was in a daze, a shadow flashed past behind his back. With lightning reflexes, he kicked the shadow out, quickly killing it. A horned rabbit? As the rabbit disappeared, a coin spawned out. Plus one copper coin. This is it? Picking up the copper coin, he was speechless. Even if he killed all year round, he would never earn enough money for his resources. Seeing that he was in no further danger, he tapped on the inscription tab. Inscription tab. Please select the profession before proceeding. Profession? Soon, a list of professions popped up for him to choose from. Without hesitation, he chose blacksmith. Divine Forge. Level, 0. Class, Tier 0 Blacksmith. Wealth, 1 Copper Coin. Inscription Tab. Tapping on the Inscription Tab again, a list was presented in front of him. Inscription Tab. Minerals, 0. Herbs, 0. Fire, 0. Weapon, 0. Huh? What is this? After clicking on Material, a list of Tier 0 materials popped up in front of him. From iron, copper, steel, and such, every mortal material was on the list. Behind every material was a progress bar. Like iron and copper, it was already at 100%. Iron, tier 0 100%. Cost, 10 copper coin per ingot. Could no longer inscribe. Tapping on aluminum with 0%, a smile appeared on his face. Aluminum, tier 0 0%. Cost, 1000 copper coin per ingot. Solo inscription joint inscription? Solo inscription, taking on the inscription of the material personally. Reward, 100% progress would make the material free, level up guarantee until level 100. Note, the generated product couldn't be sold. Note, you can't inscribe other material until 100% progress. Warning, the higher the progress, the harder the inscription. Joint inscription, taking on public inscription tasks. Reward, Discount based on percentage up to 10%, experience based on percentage. Note, multiple inscriptions can be taken. Hustle this is where the money lies. If he could inscribe a complete set of materials, he could mass produce an item with zero cost. The note only said that the generated material couldn't be sold. After he created a weapon, it was a different item altogether. As for joint inscription, he never considered it. Although it would be faster to accumulate experience, it was not cost-effective. Looking for a safe place, he set up a temporary base. After choosing the solo inscription task, a dense array of unrecognizable inscriptions lay in front of him. Although it was unfamiliar, according to the instructions, he only needed to trace it. Such a convenient thing? Even if a kid could do this thing, how hard could it be? Placing his hand on the screen, he felt a little bit of his soul being sucked out as he traced his hands. After a few minutes, he felt his soul depleted. Warning, soul energy reaches the threshold. Please rest. Looking at his progress, he smiled wryly. Aluminum, tier 00.1%. It had only been a few minutes, and already, his soul felt exhausted. 
no wonder there was a warning advising against taking solo inscription tasks. For a mortal without any potions, special apparatus, and such, it would take a day to recover soul energy. To inscribe a tier 0 material solo as a mortal would take a thousand days. In the case that you take on a solo inscription task at every level, you would need over 300 years to level up to 100. Tsk, TSK, what a scam. Fortunately, I'm different, Draven smiled. Mobilizing his battle will, he quickly regenerated his soul energy. Feeling replenished, he smiled. Let's continue. In the Imperial Castle, Maximus slowly opened his eyes and looked through his system panel. Myriad World Mall, perfect mastery. It's done. Although happy, Maximus was a little disappointed. A few years ago, once the population hit a hundred quadrillion, the amalgamation of will he receive also hit its peak, reaching one quintillion per day. With over half of the population reaching tier 1, he could gather over 500 quadrillion units of amalgamation of will. With about 1% reaching tier 2, another 100 quadrillion units of amalgamation of will was in his pocket. Plus, the various powerhouses from soldiers to top students. It could be said that reaching a quintillion units of amalgamation of will was expected. As soon as Maximus reached a quintillion, he put the myriad world mall into the agenda. From 100 quintillion for initial mastery to 800 quintillion for perfect mastery, Maximus spent 1,500 quintillion in total. The problem was perfect mastery was already the limit the system could achieve. Maximus would need to comprehend it himself if he wanted to master it further. Moreover, although he mastered it through perfection, the security encryption of the transdimensional system was still solid. Maximus thought that after studying the Myriad World Mall, he could arbitrarily set his money to any number he liked. Who knew he couldn't even increase the star rating of his shop? Even changing the font and color of the shop name was impossible. It seemed that the transdimensional system he mastered was different altogether. Fortunately, studying the Myriad World Mall to perfection still had its benefits. First is the security. Maximus could encrypt his shop with various walls to make his coordinates untraceable. Unless it's the creator itself, no one could find his shop coordinates. Even in his rune inscription, Maximus could incorporate such security. The rune language he was using in the Moonlight Engine was related to his ultimate dimensional physique. Rune is the innate language of the world. After becoming a tier 9 rune master, Maximus created his own rune language related to his own physique. Using it, the flow at which the Etherforge reactor absorbed his mana shot up to a hundred times. Now, it could produce 100 million units of energy or low magic crystal per day. Without such security, he wouldn't dare to present such a rune language in the world. After others mastered it, one could still steal his mana without his permission. Although he had an unlimited amount of it, it was still daunting to think that someone was stealing from his backyard. The security encryption knowledge he just mastered came at the right time. After setting it up, one must know the core inscription he put in to decode his rune language. As for the second benefit, it's creating a system. Not a full-blown system that could bind others remotely, but a castrated version that needed some physical device. With this knowledge, Maximus planned to upgrade the identity token of his people. Not only can it contain more functions, it would also further bind the people to him. As for the third benefit, Maximus managed to get a glimpse of the family and power system. In the past, looking at the system core program, it was just a bunch of garbled codes. But now, like understanding programming, he could understand it a bit. This is a major milestone for his future, wanting to study or even upgrade his system. Chapter 338 Tiers de Physique While reviewing the changes in the Myriad World Mall, Maximus observed the resurrected Apex sovereigns and see how they were doing in the Empire. Decades prior, as soon as he conquered the Curse Continent, Maximus initiated the revival of these powerhouses. The Abyss would invade in just a few hundred years. To delay its advance, Malgren needed to sow chaos in the abyss and disrupt their plan. To make it easier, Malgren requested the assistance of his past comrades. Although Maximus doubted Malgren's true intention, he readily agreed. After several decades of gestation and regaining their memories, it appeared they were doing quite well. Initially, he could directly awaken their memories. However, with such powerhouses under his roof, Maximus couldn't bear not to utilize them. Once they regained their peak power, the amalgamation of will they generated would be equivalent to hundreds of monarch-level abyss source. Moreover, as a citizen of the Moonlight Empire, they couldn't simply turn a blind eye if something were to happen to it, right? 
The power of childhood memories is long-lasting, no matter how ancient, they remain nostalgic. Even Maximus still vividly remembered his past life memories as a child, let alone these apex sovereigns. Seeing that they were assimilating well with the empire, Maximus smiled. I will take you to the abyss later. It was too early to send them there. Maximus still had much to do. More importantly, it was time to upgrade his physique. Dimensional source, 0 slash 1 sextillion. With a quintillion every day, it would only take him a few years, and he would have unlimited power of law. Although he possessed an amalgamation of will that nearly made his power of law inexhaustible, having a conceptual infinity was still a plus. With his experiment into the device that could directly extract energy from him at the source. He could also create a weapon utilizing his power of law. Imagining millions of weapons attacking with his full power at once excited him. At that point, Maximus would no longer need to rely on expensive tier 10 items and could combat a tier 9 apex sovereign alone. He also needed to upgrade the Empire's token system. Since the Moonlight Empire plans to open to the outside world soon, updating the token system was imperative. Furthermore, to accommodate other apps created by those companies, a mere jade token wouldn't suffice. The processing capacity of such a token would crash once millions of small apps were uploaded to it. Currently, they were still conceptualizing their little games, affording him plenty of time. Ten years later, Maximus quietly admired his work, feeling its power. The orb of destruction, how domineering. The crystal ball brimmed with the immense power of law, eclipsing even the essence of law. A million units of power of law concentrated in a small ball, Maximus doubted if an apex sovereign could even survive being struck by this thing. Years ago, after he upgraded his physique, his power of law became unlimited as expected. Dimensional Source Tier 10 Unfortunately, not seeing points beside it, Maximus was a little disappointed. Although he already knew that the system limit was Tier 10. Seeing that it could no longer upgrade his physique further disappointed him. His system was a fragment of a Tier 12 treasure, barely reaching Tier 11. To manipulate knowledge and all kinds of things up to Tier 10 was already good. He can't ask it further than its ability. He could only be thankful that he even possessed such a system. In the future, it would be up to his hard work to advance. Fortunately, he had already found his path. With power and wealth, Maximus didn't believe that anything could stop him from reaching the top. Having unlimited power of law, Maximus felt itchy and went to create a weapon to utilize it. Unfortunately, to utilize the power of law, a mere tier 9 expanding item like the Atomic God Metal was not enough. Even uniting the components of various tier 10 items would get destroyed easily after a few uses. Not having the time and enough money to continue such experiments, Maximus pursued another path. Maximus created an item that could store his power of law in large quantities without getting destroyed. After a decade, he finally created the Orb of Destruction. This device could store up to a million units of power of law, boosting an immense power. The only problem was that it couldn't directly draw mana from his source. Maximus needed to manually load it with his power of law, thus slowing the process. At his current discharge speed of power of law, he could create 10 of Orb OD destruction every day, which is over 3,000 every year. Although Maximus hadn't tested its power, feeling the energy within it. He estimated that one Orb of Destruction is equivalent to the full attack power of an Apex Sovereign. There's also the Orb of Destruction 2.0, made mainly of Tier 10 materials, capable of storing a billion units of power of law. Its destructive power is comparable to a full attack of an ancient Apex Sovereign like Dean Fialon and those peak Apex Sovereign. Unfortunately, it's costly, just one of them cost him a quintillion dimensional coins. Compared to the other, which is dirt cheap, costing him a trillion dimensional coins for one, Orb of Destruction 2.0 is not so cost-effective. He only had about 10 quintillion income in his shops yearly. Coupled with the few quintillions he earned from reselling items to the Ethereum realm, Maximus could only create 10 of Orb of Destruction 2.0 a year if he insisted. However, having the power comparable to the peak Apex Sovereigns, such a means is still necessary. After tabulating all his harvest, Maximus looked at the revived Apex Sovereigns in his empire. In the virtual world, Codexia, Draven was quietly inspecting his workshop. Guild leader, the Yttrium Gold is running out of supply. Hmm? Running out already? Our members were quite diligent, furthermore, the swords made of Yttrium Gold were quite popular. Popular? I remember that swords made of Yttrium Gold are only good for insects. What happened? It's the insect guild leader. 
I heard they spawned insect monsters everywhere, almost filling our area. Don't those insects cost anything? No, apparently, their guild leader is a tier 6 in real life. Having such a huge soul energy, he managed to inscribe a tier 3 insect solo. No wonder. Draven frowned. After decades of playing the game, Draven accumulated many solo inscribed items, making them free. Having leveled up to over 300 and possessing over 300 free items, he was as rich as he could be. In real life, he also managed to reach tier 5 without any problem. Wanting to earn more money, Draven formed a workshop guild. As for the insect guild, it was an emerging guild of lunatics. Their professions were not something decent, like insect master, slime master, slug master, etc. They spawned monsters, causing chaos in the Codexia world. Dying in this world came with heavy punishment. Aside from leveling down, you would also lose all progress on your current inscription task. One had to know that leveling up in this world is insanely difficult. From 0-100, it could take a few months to a few years just to level up. As for 101 to 200, it could take a few years at minimum. As for mortals, they could only wish to advance after reaching tier 1 in real life. The soul energy needed for these levels is not something a mortal could come up with. As for 201 to 300, it could take decades just for a level up. Even Draven, with the cheat of inexhaustible soul energy, was only over level 300. In real life, he was already tier 5, yet was only over level 300 in this virtual world, proving the difficulty of leveling up. As for the insect guild, causing chaos had its merits. For every one they killed, they earned coins, progress, and items at a certain percentage. It can be said that killing people is more profitable than mindlessly grinding and doing inscription tasks. As for the other players, the chaos they caused also benefited them somehow. Like the surge in sales of his weapons. Draven could be said to be earning dozens of times his normal income during this wave of chaos. There were also coins spawned by these monsters. Unlike the previous horned rabbit, killing these monsters was hundreds to thousands of times more profitable. There were also items that could be dissected from these monsters, which was a huge profit. While Draven was instructing his guild members on the following task, a notification tab appeared in front of him. Draven Hammer by the decree of his majesty, you are summoned to present yourself at the imperial city immediately. Your presence is requested to address matters of significant importance to the realm. Your dutiful attendance is both expected and required, as your expertise and counsel are deemed invaluable in the deliberations to ensue. With utmost respect and anticipation. Chief Minister Doran. What is this? Chapter 339 Go Back to Abyss a few days later, Draven arrived at the imperial city with haste. Although he didn't know what the emperor wanted from him, he had to go nonetheless. All the things he cared about were in this empire. If he didn't want things to go haywire, he needed to participate in this discussion regardless of the situation. Looking at such a prosperous city, he still couldn't help but sigh. The Moonshadow City is indeed different from the rest. The city was like a roaring dragon floating from the ground, infinitely extending as if there were no end. Above was the imperial castle, floating above all, overlooking the whole continent. At the city gate, after showing his invitation, Draven was formally escorted up to the castle. After a bunch of ceremonial stuff, Draven was finally led inside the castle. There, he saw nine others with the same shocked expressions, looking at each other. You. You're Draven. Raven, damn. Is that you? Draven also greeted, seeing his friend. It's really you. Does that mean the others are also? That's right, all the people from epics ago were gathered here, Raven said solemnly. But there are only nine? In the beginning, there were twelve apex sovereigns in the Nexus continent, coupled with Alistair, there are thirteen. Seeing that there were only nine made Draven think that something had happened to them. They were probably late or something. We can only hope so. By the way, when were you resurrected? Draven asked the group. About decades ago, as for my memories, I regained them ten years ago. Hm, me too. It seems that we are all the same? Draven muttered, looking at their expressions. Their reincarnation should be staggered. The weaker the strength, the faster the reincarnation. However, seeing they are reincarnated at the same time, they couldn't help but doubt. It's probably the Emperor. They suddenly realized. For the Emperor to invite them all here. It seemed that the emperor had long known their identities. Shaking their heads, they began to talk about what they had been doing in the past decade. 
seeing that they all reached tier 6, it seemed that they were all doing well in the empire. I'm just playing the game, Kadoxia, my guild workshop was earning quite a lot of money, Draven started. Tisk TSK, you're quite a hard worker. I tried it in the beginning, but it's hard to grind all day long, a raven said, sighing. Not everyone was like Draven, even though he had inexhaustible soul energy. Raven can't work and grind almost 24 hours a day. He preferred a young master life, where he just needed to stretch his hand and be lazy. Then what did you do? It can't be that you stole or assassinated someone, are you? Draven asked worriedly. Raven was the famed phantom assassin. In the past, Raven even attempted to assassinate Malgren. Unfortunately, he failed miserably. Of course not, my rebirth parents are quite rich. So? Could it be enough for your training? To reach tier 6 so quickly is not just some rich parent could afford. No, but being rich has its perks, that is huge funds. With enough money, Raven was like the shadow behind the scenes, controlling a conglomerate. Taking his family as a front and using his brains, he was able to grow their business to one of the top today. Given enough time, it could even rival those hegemons that had grown since the beginning of the empire. A few hours later. After seeing that the emperor who summoned them was still not here, they became impatient for a while. Wanting to ask someone for the news, they suddenly saw a man giving off a sharp sword aura. Alistair? You're still alive? A few hours had already passed, and seeing no one was coming in, they thought something happened to others. How could I die? Alistair smirked, seeing his past seniors weaker than him. Still cheeky as always. Haha, how about we spar for a bit? Alistair smiled and proposed. Tisk, TSK, reaching tier 8 before us didn't make you strong, you know? Anyway, how did you reach tier 8 so quickly? Did you reincarnate before us? Most of them were still tier 6, thus, seeing their junior Alistair already reach tier 8, they were shocked. You guess? You really reincarnated earlier than us. Seeing Alistair's expression, it seemed that Alistair really reincarnated before them. But if that's the case, then how could we be reincarnated simultaneously and not you? The Emperor should know the reason, Alistair said solemnly, seeing the man slowly walking onto the podium. Greet the Emperor. Doran beside Maximus reminded. We greet the Emperor, like a reflex, the nine apex sovereigns knelt and bowed before Maximus. Even Alistair was somewhat affected and bowed. You're welcome, you should take a seat, Maximus smiled, waving his hand. It seemed that the education of their parents was working seeing they respected him so much. Maximus wondered how Malgren would react, knowing his subordinates were bowing to another man. Thinking about it, his smile couldn't help but widen. I summoned you all here because of a request from a friend. Your Majesty, is the one you're talking to Malgren? It seems that you are indeed keen. My friend Malgren instructed that you go to the abyss and help him fight a battle. Hearing this, they clenched their fists with worry and excitement. Worry that the situation of the abyss became grimmer, that even their invincible boss needed their help. Excitement because they could fight side by side with that man again. They, the proud apex sovereigns of the former Nexus continent, were brought up by Malgren from scratch. With his wisdom and power, he chose them to witness his ever. Flowing glory. Your Majesty, do you perhaps know what happened to Amara and Valoros? Suddenly, they remembered that two individuals were still missing. Amara, like Alistair, reincarnated quite early, by now, she was already in the abyss. As for Valoros, Maximus paused, not knowing whether to tell them that he had killed the man himself. He's gone. Gone? Is he dead? Soon, they mobilized their battle will to look for Valoro's battle will. However, after scouring, they found out that the battle will representing Valoro's was gone. Just what happened? Not knowing what happened, they unconsciously looked at Maximus. This is quite complicated, Malgren will explain it to you later, Maximus shook his head, deciding not to tell the whole truth. Soon after a few more discussions about what had happened, they returned home to say goodbye to their families. Being with them for decades, their hearts couldn't help but soften, treating them as a real family. Although they noticed that it was Maximus' conspiracy, thinking of their short but happy and peaceful life. They couldn't deny such a honey trap. As for Alistair, he took his time visiting the Empire, looking for traces of his past. Unfortunately, the Moonlight Empire changed beyond imagination. From a deserted land to a prosperous metropolis, Alistair didn't even see the similarities. As for his sister Amara, Alistair just smiled wryly. Amara had already told him about her identity over a hundred years ago. 
Having already had doubts, he was not so shocked. But still, knowing that his sister married another man, he couldn't help but clench his fist. Unfortunately, after looking around, he couldn't find that bastard in the empire. Alastair also didn't dare to ask the emperor of the Moonlight Empire. Just feeling his overwhelming oppression earlier, he felt his back sweat. It was like facing Malgren in full force that Alastair couldn't muster any courage. Soon, a month later, the former Apex sovereigns met up in the castle. Seeing them arrive, Maximus smiled. This time, not only were the former Apex sovereigns going to the Abyss Realm, but Maximus also took his family with him. Apparently, they missed the others staying at the Abyss. Fortunately, Maximus could go to the Abyss Realm whenever he wanted. In the past, he needed to gather his mana for at least thirty years to go to another dimension. Now, with his power of law, Maximus only needed a few months to do the same. Seeing that they were all in place, Maximus initiated the teleportation. In the abyss at the Shadow Hunter stronghold. So this is the abyss, huh? The corrosive energy is too thick. Fortunately, there is this barrier. Seeing the abyss for the first time, the former Apex sovereigns couldn't help but look around curiously. Feeling the corrosive abyss aura all around, they couldn't help but be thankful for the barrier around. If not for it, their bodies would be slowly eroded by now. They were only tier 6, and the corrosive abyss aura could eat them bit by bit. We're here. You could meet Malgren at the Battle Axe Bar, Maximus said, waving his hand and sending them outside his residence. This was a private residence of him and his family, he didn't want some stranger to stay here longer. Now, how about we meet the others? Maximus asked, also missing his children and grandchildren. Chapter 340 Abyss Situation after sending the former Apex sovereigns to Battle Axe Bar, Maximus called his children, grandchildren, and in-laws who stayed in the Abyss. Upon receiving the message, Liam and the others quickly dropped what they were doing and went to the Shadow Hunter stronghold. A few days later, Maximus and the others looked at the people who arrived with smiles. Welcome back. Dad. Mothers. Uh. Lily and the girls muttered tearfully as they hugged them. Looking at the girls, Maximus unconsciously smiled. Lily, Lila, Lydia, and Syra looked pretty fatigued but exuded an unfathomable aura. Just by looking at them, one would know they had undergone intense battles regularly. Did you miss us? We missed you a lot, Dad. Lily muttered, looking at him pitifully. Lily thought that their father would return just a few years after returning to the Ethereum realm. Who knew it would be decades later? Although they had no problem staying in the Abyss. Fighting all the time, all day long, was pretty exhausting. Dad, did you also miss us? Lila asked, jumping on his back. We missed you a lot. Then why didn't you come earlier? Lydia muttered, accusing him. Maybe Dad forgot about us? Syra chimed in. How could I forget about you? I'm just a bit busy. Maximus reason. Anyway, it's Dad's fault. Lila huffed. That's right. The others quickly nodded. Seeing that they wouldn't stop, Maximus smiled wryly. All right, all right, just tell me what you want. Who told me to be your father? Yay. Dad, you promise you will do anything? Hmm. Then we're in for a treat. Lily smirked, looking at her sisters planning for something. What about we talk while we eat? Maximus suggested, seeing Erica just finished cooking. The others also nodded somewhat hungry. At the table, Maximus looked at his two sons and asked, How about you, Liam and Max? How are you doing in the abyss? Liam and Max looked a little more mature, like battle-hardened middle-aged men. We're doing just fine, father, Liam nodded. I'm fine too, dad, just a little bored, Max replied. Although the abyss is full of fights and wars, it's too monotonous for his liking. Those abyss monsters didn't have much skill. They only rely on numbers and strength. After decades of fighting with them, Max already grew bored. That's good, that's good. How about you girls? Did your husbands wrong you? Maximus asked, looking at Amara, Elisani, and Ella. Ha ha ha, Liam wished, Gelazien laughed a little. Elisani was already a high god, even if Liam was strong, he was just a tier 8, after all. As for Amara, she just smiled. Amara also regained her former glory, reaching tier 9. After obtaining a few hundred quintillion crystal merits from Malgren, reaching tier 9 was just a matter of time. As a boss, Malgren was quite generous, giving her vast amounts of resources without asking. 
Although Amara would have liked to wait for Maximus to create the Tier 9 chapter of Origin before advancing, it was not possible. Maximus had already told them that it was up to them to advance to Tier 9. This was a hurdle that only they could overcome. Maximus didn't know how long it would take him to conceive the Tier 9 chapter of Origin. Even now, with over a quintillion system points every day, he couldn't foresee when he would conceive it. Maybe a million years or epochs, Maximus was not sure. He didn't want them to waste their time because of him. As for Ella, upon hearing Maximus ask if Max had done something wrong, she pouted. Yes, Max often beats me. What? Maximus looked at Max as if wanted to beat him. Huh? But it's a spar, aren't I supposed to fight back? Max looked puzzled. No, you're supposed to stand there and let me beat you. But, but dash. Umph. Anyway, you beat me. Punish him, father-in-law. Ella said, her eyes lighting up. Seeing this, Maximus just smiled, looking at Max with pity. By the way, father-in-law, my grandfather and grandmother were asking when you would marry my auntie. This dash, Maximus paused, looking at Denise. Their wedding was getting so delayed that he almost forgot. Doing everything that a husband and wife should do, Maximus thought it didn't matter anymore. However, looking at Ella's seriousness and Denise's longing, Maximus couldn't definitively express his thoughts. The Moonlight Empire will be open to the world in just a few years, and that day will also be the day I marry you all again. Maximus looked at his wife seriously. Since there would be a wedding ceremony, why not make it grander and include all his wives? In the Ethereum realm, there is no taboo in weddings. It is not even highly regarded, only some nobles and traditional families care for it. To marry multiple people at once is not uncommon. There were even some emperors who married thousands every year or so to form their million or billion harems. Maximus was already quite gentlemanly, marrying only over a dozen wives. Then I would tell my grandmother to attend. Ella smiled, excited to see how grand the wedding would be. Even Hazel and the others were excited. They were getting married again. For a couple, no matter how many times they were married, there was no problem. As long as they could stand the hassle and the cost, it didn't matter how many times they married. They just treated it as an extra special celebration for the love of their lives. As they were eating, Maximus noticed that Lux and his two grandsons, Sylvan and Martin, were not present. Where is Lux, Sylvan, and Martin? Lux must be busy and didn't have time to come, Liam replied. As for Sylvan and Martin, those two brats are all around the abyss. Sometimes, it would take years before we could meet them. Those brats! Hearing this, Nathan muttered in dissatisfaction. It was already the family gathering, yet his two sons didn't even have time to look for their mother and father. Thinking of this, he couldn't help but look at Zoe, planning to have another child. Humph, we don't need those brats, we can create another one, he thought. Nathan Zoe blushed, seeing the meaning in his eyes. Unfortunately, in their current state, it's not so easy to give birth. They already have three children, and at their current tier, having another one would be a miracle. Could you tell me about the abyss? Maximus asked Liam. The abyss has become pretty chaotic these past few decades. Chaotic? Isn't it always chaotic? No, the Ethereum realm and the abyss are already in an all-out war. A few years after his father left, the Ethereum Council decided to conquer the whole boundary layer. Because of the arrival of Tier 6 powerhouses from the Ethereum realm, the living space in the abyss continues to dwindle. An outpost can only do so much, not to mention it's too expensive to build. Wanting to have more people in the abyss and dig more resources, the Ethereum Council put out a crazy plan to conquer the boundary layer. It has almost limitless space, filled with various resources. Furthermore it was not like the chaotic sea, where one needed high tier means to get resources. In the abyss, where resources are scattered all around, one just needs a little digging. With huge profits ahead of them, they launched a crazy war against the abyss. So did they succeed? Yes, just after a decade of resistance, the boundary layer was captured. Capturing the boundary layer and cleaning up all the high-tier monsters and dangers. Those powerhouses built arrays all around to keep the abyss aura to a minimum. After years of construction and millions and trillions of individuals working, the boundary layer was formally captured. Now, the abyss aura around was so negligible that a mortal could survive with their bare body. In the past, they could never dream of doing this. After all, even if they had enough manpower and strength to do so, they didn't have enough materials. However, with Maximus's help, getting the materials just needed some money. 
Hearing this, Maximus nodded in understanding. No wonder decades ago, Fialon bought various materials from him costing magic crystals worth hundreds of quintillions of dimensional coins. What about the middle layer and purgatory layer? The middle layer was the crossroads of war between the two dimensions. It was too chaotic that even some apex sovereigns died, Liam said with a sigh. Seeing that the boundary layer was conquered, how could the abyss monarchs let it be? Unfortunately, with Malgren lurking around, they couldn't get out of the core layer. Their only choice was to send the subordinates they had cultivated to suppress these maggots from eroding the abyss. Thus, the biggest battle since the Ethereum realm faced the abyss began. As for the purgatory layer, it became a forbidden ground. It became the breeding ground for the abyss monsters who were fighting for war. Only strongholds with hidden futures, such as the Ethereum Citadel, Shadow Hunter Stronghold, and Eternal Outpost, were capable of venturing the purgatory layer. They were the hidden blade of the Ethereum realm, ready to cause a fatal blow when needed. All in all, the abyss was more chaotic than ever. It was also the prelude that would open the world to higher dimensions for the time to come. 